everybody, and welcome to today's Illuminate presentation on working in and with, not working? Okay, sorry, it is working, okay. So welcome to today's Illuminate presentation on working in and with communities. Um, my name is Marlene Stern. I'm the project coordinator for the um, collaboration between the uh, uh, Amsterdam University of Applied Sciences, and we're delighted to welcome our guests from uh, the university uh, in Amsterdam. And um, there are six here today. One's leaving, one's coming, and one more is coming. So um, today, a year, about a year ago um, this week, Reg Urbanowski, Dean Urbanowski, was in Amsterdam and forging a partnership between the University of Amsterdam. And this morning, um, Reg um, and Dean Postel and Dean Lerma signed this letter of intent. So I think it's a very auspicious day today to have this presentation and for you all to be here to join us. Um, a few logistics before I introduce our presenters. Stefan, um, who presented yesterday, Raymakers, um, his slides didn't function as well as we wanted them to. Some of them were in Dutch. So um, given that, we are going to be um, sending them, uh, emailing them out to everybody. Um, after today's Illuminate presentation, we're going to have a combined working session lunch uh, for those who can make it back at uh, in the college in room 110. It's bag lunch, so bring your own lunch. Um, and um, I think that's it before I introduce our presenters. So. I'm delighted to uh, introduce our presenters today, both from the University of Manitoba and Amsterdam. So our first presenter today is Lisa diamond Burchuk. Lisa is an instructor in the Department of Occupational Therapy, and she's also a clinician at the Northern Connections Medical Clinic. Um, she's worked in all ages across the continuum of care in various clinical settings. Lisa has developed a passion for the role of OT in primary care and wants to spread the word about all the skills in the OT toolbox, and she's been doing that across the province uh, nationally. Uh, she's supported the development of emerging community roles through field work and is the founder and chair of the Manitoba Primary Health Care Community of Practice. Our next presenter is Sandra Bishabell. Please, did I get your name sort of right? You'll correct me. Sorry, in the Department of Respiratory Therapy and um, is an instructor in the program. She teaches respiratory therapeutics as well as respiratory therapy and um, in primary care and, oops, and professional practice in the context of the healthcare system. She's, her professional background has been across the continuum of care and she's helped to develop pulmonary rehab services in Winnipeg. Our third uh, Man University of Manitoba presenter is Maureen Walker. She's a physiotherapist and teaches at the University of Manitoba. She's the coordinator and supervisor of the Physiotherapy Silo Mission Service Learning Project and the Cancer Care Manitoba Clinical Student Placements. Her teaching is strongly influenced by her cancer survivorship and the firm belief that exercise is medicine. Our presenter from Amsterdam is Margot van Hartingsveld. Um, and Margot is an occupational therapist. Um, she's worked for over 25 years as a pediatric therapist in various clinical settings. She's a professor of occupational therapy in participation and environment at the Faculty of Health in Amsterdam and is the head of the department. Margot was the first author of the occupational therapy profile of occupational therapist and of the profile of specialization of pediatric therapist and the editor of many editions of the Fundamentals of Occupational Therapy for Occupational Therapy Practice in the Netherlands and in Flanders. So please join me in welcoming our distinguished guests. Hey, I'm Lisa, um, and I'd like to start by acknowledging that we are on Aboriginal lands in Treaty 1 territory. Um, where Indigenous peoples have lived since the beginning. Uh, as white settlers, we're grateful for the opportunity to gather here and to live, work, and play here. And we thank the Indigenous peoples of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, Dene, and Métis people who have stewarded and cared for this land since the beginning. Um, and we're grateful for the role they have played in taking this community to the place it is today and in shaping what it's become. And we collectively commit as settlers 
to work towards the promise of truth and reconciliation and towards ensuring that it addresses the harms of today and fighting for justice for missing and murdered Indigenous women and fighting for equal access to rights and resources for all Canadians. Um, and so again, we want to say thank you for that. So I'm going to speak a little bit. My slides are actually a bit more organized than uh, the way the process really evolved because it was a very organic process. And so I'm going to tell it as a story, really more in a storytelling form, which is really more the way it evolved. And in the background, there'll be some slides for those of you who like some more organization <laughs> and lists. Um, but really, all of this evolved in the context of relationship. And I think our professions have known for a very long time that the relationship is the core and the key. But we found in this environment here at the university environment in the last few years, partly um, due to um, the voices of our Indigenous colleagues within our facility or within our faculty, but also due to our leadership, we've really found that there's been a making or creation of space for nurturing and developing those relationships. And it's because of those relationships that these projects were able to evolve. And they really did just evolve naturally out of that. So I'm going to talk about briefly about two projects that happened. So the first one, so our guests, you were with me yesterday at Northern Connections and you saw that in the basement of where Northern Connections is housed, there's also a clinic called Bridge Care, where primary health care services are provided to newcomers to Canada. And it was by virtue of that co-location that we started to develop relationships with the bridge care clinicians. They're actually very separate clinics and programs, but we, because we were neighbors, we wanted to know how we could help each other. They were overwhelmed um, by a wave of refugees, Yazidi refugees in particular, and refugees from Syria at a certain point in time. And we wanted to know how we could help them. And I had a relationship that I had developed with the shared care counselor and the nurse practitioner just by being there together and we started talking and um, uh, my dean and their director gave us permission to see what we could come up with and so we talked about um, what really what their need was and what they really identified was that they had no access to occupational therapy and they had no access to mental health care for the children the adults had it the parents had it but the children didn't and the children had experienced and witnessed horrific trauma before coming to Canada, and it was a real need. So we talked, basically. We met periodically, frequently actually, and we just talked. And I learned a lot from them. I learned so much that I didn't know. I learned that the families were not going to want to get counseling for their children. The children's language wasn't bad. The parents' language English was definitely, you know, needed a lot of um, development. But even if that was not a factor, the families were not culturally going to be interested in talk therapy. And they were not going to be interested in getting therapy for their children because there was a real taboo for them for that. But the children, what we, when I, as we talked, and we talked about what the needs were and what the, what the cultural context was, and I talked a bit about OT and some of our strategies, we kind of landed on a strategy that we realized was a perfect fit. Um, and it was such a perfect fit that the nurse, the nurse and the clinician there, they were so excited about this because they'd never heard of it. And it's really an OT program, the How Does Your Engine Run program which teaches self-regulation strategies to children using their body instead of their thoughts, right? So we call it tools for the hands, the mouth, the eyes, the body, and teaching how to um, bring their engine speed up because a lot of these kids, and this is part of what I learned from the therapist from the clinic, a lot of the kids are hyper aroused, right? Always in a state of alert, but some of them do the opposite, right? They shut down and they're hypo aroused. And so we talked about, well, this is a great tool that we think all children in Canada should learn how to self-regulate using their, you know, and how to be aware of their feelings. So it's not a treatment, it's just learning some skills. And what if we presented it in the context of a summer camp instead of it being like therapy? And so it kind of evolved. We had some other real strengths. Um, as you can see, and one of those was that we have a great role emerging fieldwork program already established here um, and a great supportive fieldwork team. I had experience through my primary care role of doing off-site supervision fieldwork, so I was comfortable with that arm's length supervision model, which you need to be. 
We also realized that the university facilities were sitting mostly empty. The cores, rooms and equipment and bowls and mats and all that great stuff was sitting not being used in the summer. So we had some good resources that way. And then we also had access to, when, to the, an interpreter service. So we were able to have interpreters involved. So I got a student, an OT student, and we planned for her to spend her final fieldwork with me creating and running this program. It also involved a bit of flexibility on her part because we wanted her to do some of the work ahead of time because we wanted her to meet with the clinic team and be part of the planning and she trusted that I would make sure she got that time back <laughs> later on as part of her fieldwork and she did. So basically we had some meetings and we shared ex we, information. We taught them about self-regulation and they taught us about working with the Yazidi community and pr it was primarily the student responsible for pulling together the resources, the plan for the group and everything with my supervision. So then we ran a one-week summer camp which we ran, it was myself, the student, the shared care counselor and the nurse practitioner, and then three WHA, WHA interpreters. And we basically used the university space and labs, minimal costs, which were just shared between the two partners in terms of um, you know, snacks, because you have to have snacks, right? And that's not just, that's, that seems to be a, a, across all cultures, right? That whether you want to call it breaking bread, feasting, whatever it is, that's part of that, that relationship. So the, the outcomes, which were great, were that both the children and the families learned self-regulation strategies that they could use. And so this was part of what I learned from the clinic staff, right? I knew, well, the parents have to learn the skills too so that they can reinforce them with the kids. But what I learned from the clinic staff was we needed to actually be able to teach them together in the same room because part of the trauma experience that they have experienced involves separation. And that was a huge challenge to have them, everyone in the same room all the time. But we, we knew that they needed to have eyes on their kids at all times. And so those are the kinds of things that I learned from them that I wouldn't have known otherwise. So we ran the program and the, the children and the families learned the strategies, but also the, shared care, or the bridge care staff learned the skills and strategies that they planned then to use with their own clients moving forward. They also learned the role and scope of OT and I'd be surprised if that bridge care clinic doesn't have an OT within the next 10 years because they were pretty impressed and excited about what we could offer to help them. And then of course for the student the learning was invaluable, right? She learned the clinical content but she also learned about community programming so that was amazing. So then the second project I will talk about, which ran the same summer, just to give you a sense of it is possible to do all this at once. Um, that was out of Panemutang, which is um, a reserve about three hours north of Winnipeg. And that relationship developed because they were invited to come to Winnipeg a few times. And then we drove out, Reg and um, Deborah from um, Amgamas in Education and I, we, run, we drove out a couple of times and we met with the community and we talked about what their needs were, and there were a lot, but we talked yesterday in our working session about the low-hanging fruit, and we decided that the low-hanging fruit, something that we could do now immediately, because we just felt like, oh, this community has heard promises from our government for generations, and we want them to believe us that we're really ready now to help now. It's not about doing things down the road. So we said we could do this now. We can do it immediately. And so what that need was, we talked also yesterday about that Jordan's Principal funding for kids with special needs, but they have all these young adults who they're too late. That program is brand new. These young adults don't, they're too, they don't qualify for it. They're living in the community. They have no living skills. They have no meaningful occupation they have no employment, they have no life skills. What do they do for these kids? So again, we had some great strengths and um, we had a few different strengths to add on this time. So one is that this community has a great, really strong community health team and a great community health center. They have accommodations. And our fieldwork team, again, came to the rescue um, the, in the usual way, but they also sought out um, and worked with the Interprofessional Office of Interprofessional Education, and they secured funding to pay for travel and accommodations for the students, so that was great. 
And we have our independent study course. And Reg was the independent study advisor who said, OK, we'll do our students will do the background work. And so two students worked with Reg and did the research around existing programs and frameworks and proposed a framework. Um, and then they presented that actually at the independent study symposium. And the people from Panimutang came to that symposium. So, as I said, we had Reg working with the MOT students doing the background work and we had the fieldwork team getting ready and applying for funding and as well what we did ahead of time was the independent study students went with me to the community a number of times. They went to find out from the community what exactly do you want and then they met with the parents of the young adults who would be involved in the program. What exactly do you want? They met with the participants who would be participating in the program. What exactly do you want? And then they went back again and they said this is what we're thinking. Have we got it right? So there was a lot of work at the beginning which involved again that support of our going out to the community and working on that relationship. So in the end we had two fieldwork students. One was one of the independent study students which was great. It did one of the other one wasn't just the way that that worked out in terms of what the other student wanted to do. Um, and so again we gave them the first week to just get to know the community and to establish trust in the community. There were no expectations from me for that week other than that. And it's interesting, so this community has, oh, when I meet someone from who's been to the community, they joke with me, something like five or six churches in the community. And every time they met a community member, they said, you have to come to church. Are you coming to church? And so these students went in to five church services. They, they showed up. They did everything they could. They really tried to get to know the community. And that was their focus at first. And then they spent, I think it was actually five weeks, I mean four weeks rather than five weeks, doing actual programming. Kind of same idea, Monday to Friday with the, with the participants. Although they did do some evening programs too, they tried to be flexible within the community. And so they did some life skills training. They, arranged, they did a modified babysitting course because some of them were interested in learning babysitting skills. They did some of those things. Um, and then the final week, um, we also blocked off because the the team in the community had identified that they wanted a report and they wanted some funding applications because they wanted to apply for funding for this to continue. So that was their priority. So that was something as well that the students did. They blocked off time to create that application. And so they had support from me. I went to the community twice and I met with them every weekend when they came back into the city for the weekend. And they had unlimited access to me through telephone and and uh, email. So the outputs, the community loved the program. Two of the participants in the program actually had part-time employments um, created through it, which if you've been to our remote community, that is quite a feat. Um, they, the com community itself appointed someone from their staff to continue the programming just on a weekly basis so that those, resident, those participants got, got to continue until the funding application went through and it was successful and they now have funding for a community youth worker for, these, for this population. Um, and now other communities are asking to use the model to try and do something like this on their own communities. So that's all. I mean, imagine for the students what a, what a great feeling that is for them. Um, they, had, they gained invaluable experience, right? Working within communities, funding applications, all, and then again, the clinical skills. And one of the students presented at our, our national conference this past uh, spring. So that was, you know, that was pretty exciting too. Showed how proud he was of what they had accomplished. So um, I think that's it. I'll hand it over to Sandra and because we'll do questions at the end, right? And I apologize, I have to teach at one o'clock, so I might not be here for questions. Um, good afternoon, welcome. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Welcome to our visiting professors and faculty from Amsterdam. Um, as those of you who are from Amsterdam know my name, my last name is Dutch. It's not me who is Dutch, despite my husband's best efforts to teach me Dutch. It hasn't gone so well, so. <laughs> 
So anyways, it's, it's a pleasure to be here today to talk to you about some of the work that we in the respiratory therapy department have been doing to engage with First Nations communities in Manitoba. This work has come out of Reg's partnerships that he's been developing with several First Nations communities in collaboration with, with Ungomazan Institute. Um, this picture here is actually a picture of the Monago River. It runs between Thompson and Norway House. And this was en route. We flew into Thompson and we did about a three hour, three and a half hour drive to Norway House. So on this rock right about here is where I used to stand with my dad when I was a child. I, I lived in northern Manitoba till I was about 10 years old and even would go back in the summers when my dad worked. My, my dad worked for Manitoba Hydro so I would stand right on that rock. So I haven't seen this rock for over 30 years so when we drove by it I had to stop and take a photo of it. So it has special meaning in my heart. So the two communities that we, that we have, in, have done some work with with respiratory therapy is Norway House Cree Nation and Blood Vein First, uh, First Nation. So our objectives, we had a few objectives. We wanted to introduce the role of the respiratory therapist. So those of you who are from Manitoba and from, from here know that respiratory therapy services are not offered in any First Nations communities in the province and are pretty scarce across the country in First Nations communities. So we wanted to introduce the role of what RTs could possibly do in these communities. Our second objective was to assess the needs for respiratory therapy services. We can say that yes, that because they don't have RTs, they must have needs, but we need to actually prove that they do have needs and what those needs might be. We wanted also to discuss opportunities for RTs to provide services to the community. So what could we actually provide based on the needs that we saw? Um, and also looking for ways for our students to engage. We are always looking for meaningful ways for our students to engage within the communities, various communities. They spend the majority of their clinical education in Winnipeg. They have a couple of rural sites that they're able to go to, but again, it's not the entire cohort that gets to go out to the rural areas. So having them go into a, a, a First Nations community would be even a better bonus for them and, and expose them to much more learning. And of course, also promoting the profession to the community to recruit students in the Bachelor of Respiratory Therapy program. One of our goals is also to increase the number of Indigenous students who apply to and are successful in coming into our program. And so if we, they're not being exposed to RTs on a daily basis in their community, how are they going to know about this profession? So wanting to expose and perhaps engage with some students in their high school years to get them involved and get them interested in perhaps applying into the program and helping them be successful and apply to the program. Let's see if my animations work. So far, so good. So um, this is taken from a report from the Manitoba Center for Health Policy. And the big issue is there is inequitable access to health care services by First Nations communities. It is quite desperate, the look of the, the amount of services that, that are offered. There isn't much there. Um, we need to look at narrowing the gap. We need to align with the truth and, truth and reconciliation calls to action. And we need to be partnering with First Nations leaders and researchers. The problem is there are no RT services, as I mentioned. So it's very hard to fulfill the mandate of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission um, if we are not able to provide RT services in the communities. Another thing, too, with these communities is that they are driving a great distance, and I'll show you on the next slide. Um, they can be driving anywhere from three, six, eight hours to access services because all of the tertiary specialist, spe specialist services are all offered here in Winnipeg. So they have to drive quite quite a distance. That means taking a day from work, leaving school, being away from other children, being away, having to have other caregivers bring them here, arranging for transportation. So it becomes very time consuming and can be very costly. And that's not just to access RT services, that's to access any type of medical specialized services. So just to put it into perspective, so here we have the province of Manitoba on your left. The purple is the, the country of the Netherlands. It's in there, so you can see in relation. <laughs> um, I was in the Netherlands about 11 years ago on a family vacation, and I was looking for the off-ramp on the map to get into Amsterdam because we were going to visit my husband's Oma. And I kept, he kept saying, what was that sign, what was that sign? And I said, I don't know, I don't know, because, and this is, this is going to show either my lack of intelligence or just my, my lack of ignorance. It was like this far on the map. So I'm used to a Canadian map where this far is about five hours. Well, this far on the map in the Netherlands was about 10 minutes. <laughs> so we missed, several we missed several exits off the, <laughs> off the freeway into Amsterdam. So this just puts it into perspective. So what I want to show you is the communities that we were traveling to. Well, that didn't line up where it's supposed to. So we're looking at Winnipeg here. This did work when I tried it. Yeah, they're all going short. Okay, so Winnipeg, <laughs> I don't know, it worked this morning. Winnipeg is here, 
And then we're traveling up to blood vein up here. So if you look at the distance there, so again, if we put it across, because I did make these two maps to scale. And then if we look up even further up to Norway House, so this, this is going to fall short of where Norway House actually is. Yeah, so it's just a little bit south. So we're going from Winnipeg to blood vein up to Norway House. So it's quite a distance. Um, until this past year, Nor or blood vein was only accessible by winter road or ferry across. So this was the ferry going across from uh, to Norway House. We had to cross the Nelson River, so we had to take ferry, go, go across there. So we drove and then we, we took the ferry going across to Norway House, crossing the Nelson River. This is just a shot of what it looks like in Norway House. This is the view from the hotel that we stayed. So you can see it's right along the banks of the, of, of the, of the Nelson River. It's very spread out. Um, Norway House is a population of about 10,000 people, including catchment area, and I hope I have that number right. They do have schools that go to grade 12, so students are able to complete their high school there and then leave uh, to go to university or post-secondary education if they choose. They have a health centre and I have a clinic with full-time permanent physicians who provide care on a rotating basis. So they'll have a physician up there all the time, but they're not permanently stationed there, but they do have permanent access to physicians. They also have specialized physicians who would fly in for different, for, for different needs. Um, in June of this past year, we, we spent two days up there, myself and one of my colleagues, Louise Chartrand, we were up there for a couple of days to introduce ourselves to the communities, to meet with the people who are in charge of the healthcare services and, and see some patients as well. I was seeing some patients, uh, they were all children actually who were under the care of Jordan's principal. So I did some respiratory assessments and some breathing tests, spirometries on them. Uh, Louise went out into the community and saw some patients in home, um, some who were on oxygen, some who were not, and did some assessments on them as well. What we did find was there is definitely a need. There is a huge need for education, if nothing else. Um, we had patients who were being prescribed inhalers who didn't need them. We had patients who didn't have inhalers who did need them. We had patients who were prescribed inhalers who had never had a breathing test done, who had never had a proper respiratory assessment. Um, I also had a physician come in and talk to me about a medically complex um, child that she had who was turning 19 and was therefore no longer, or turning 19 I believe, and was therefore no longer going to be covered under Jordan's principle. And there was a big sort of rigmarole around how he was going to receive care because the specialists in Winnipeg were saying, we're not coming up there, you have to get him down here. Meanwhile, he had spent most of his life in and out of hospital between the Children's Hospital here in Winnipeg and Norway House, which is about a six to eight hour drive. So family was having to take time off work, having to leave the community, having to leave other children to bring him for care. And he was hospitalized, I think in the previous September, he had been hospitalized for about three months at a time. So it, it's, there's a big need. Um, we also saw children who had multiple complex issues who just needed a better overall approach to their care. So we were looking at providing care not only on sort of a clinic basis, but also in the home. They also have a personal care home there. We saw a couple of patients there. It was interesting, there were two women who were roommates. One of them had an oxygen concentrator for oxygen therapy, the other one didn't. It was the one who actually didn't have the oxygen therapy who needed it. Um, even something simple like doing a remote sleep study, doing a portable sleep study, things like that where they're not having to leave the communities. These are things that they don't have access to. Some of the issues they have is they have very high rates of unemployment. They have a rate of about 75% unemployment, <coughs> so it's quite significant. Um, the main industry there or means of living is fishing, but still, and they also have very high rates of substance abuse. They have rules around um, if you are caught with drugs, illicit drugs, you are kicked off reserve, um, you are not allowed to have a house, so they have lots of different, these are according to the, some of the community members. So they are quite, quite strict around trying to keep their community drug-free, substance-free, but it's, it is very difficult. The second community that we went to, um, I've been up there twice. The first year, the first time I went was with, um, was with Reg, a faculty of pharmacy member, Deborah Beach uh, Ducharme from Angomazin and a member of the, the, um, the president of the Manitoba Lung Association. And we went up in July 2018. So this is just outside of their, of their health center, all nicely painted with a mural. This was the road on the way up. So this was July of 2018. We were driving, Reg was, was at the wheel. So we had lots of fun. <laughs> I don't know how we got through it with a little SUV, but we did. We got up there. So this was the road. As of this year, there is now a full 
uh, year-round access paved roads. It was, it's gravel for a bit, but it was quite a nice road to drive in September, coming up a year later. So that was a big issue for them, lack of access by road. So it was winter road, meaning going over the frozen lake in the winter time, or going up along the west side of the lake and taking a ferry across to the east side, because Blood Vein is on the east side of Lake, Manitoba, or lake Winnipeg. Um, there's an error on my slide. It actually schools to grade 9. So an issue there is now once these kids finish grade 9, they have to leave their community. So they are going one, two, three, four hours away to come and live. So they're not, they're not commuting back and forth every day to go to high school. They actually have to leave their homes. So if they have aunties or uncles or other relatives in other communities, they have to go and live with those families. So there would not be, and I don't know the rates, but I wouldn't suspect there would be a huge amount of kids. Not every child who finishes grade 9 is going to leave their home community to continue on with their high school. So that's a, a real need that they have there. Um, I actually did hear on the media, I think just last week, that they are actually planning on building a high school opening for uh, 2020. They have very high rates of crime, and actually the week before we were to go up there, we went up in September... Um, the first, I'll just backtrack a little bit. In July, we went up just to get to know the community. So we met with the band council. We met with some of the people who provide health care services just to talk about what the needs are. We looked at the possibility of perhaps doing a health fair, doing an interprofessional health fair, or, or bringing some services together, bringing students up from the different professions. Um, we had pharmacy and respiratory therapy represented there and with the Lung Association as well. We haven't gotten around to that yet. In our visit going back in September, we actually did provide some services and I brought three of our RT students with us, um, two third year students and one second year student. So we were up there and again it was Louise Chartrand and myself who went up. And Louise went with a couple of the students to go see patients in their home and just to see the living conditions. All of the homes on Blood Vein First Nation have mold. So that's a huge respiratory um, issue. And when RTs hear mold, we all kind of panic and get heart palpitations because we know how deadly mold can be. It's black mold, it's growing up. We're looking at, you know, knee length, average knee height um, up, up the walls. Um, we had an individual come in for, some, for an assessment with us and he is exhibiting symptoms of mold exposure. He also had his wife who was pregnant at the time who was recommended that she leave the home. So he was, he was, he had sent her back home. They live in Ontario and he's just out for his work in blood veins. So he had, she had to be sent back home um, and was advised not to live in the community um, even after she has the baby because of the black mold. And it is in all of the homes. The day we were there, actually, one of their, their head nurses had no heat in her house. So she had spent the night cuddling up with water bottles, hot water bottles, because they had no heat. Their access to internet, they, they only have access to internet if you happen to have it in your home. They don't have access to internet in the health center. So they're very, very isolated, very limited. They have, even though they have the road, they're still traveling three hours. They don't have physician care all the time. Um, they do have a physician who attends four days once a month. So he'll go up there, he or she will go up there on a Monday and leave on a Thursday. So we tried to coordinate our visit with the physician being up there. Um, we have plans to go back to Norway House next June. Actually, I think I'll be going back up there next June to do some more work up there in, in collaboration with Louise and some research that, that we're doing on looking at the role of respiratory therapy in First Nations and primary care. I just wanted to end off and not cut into Maureen's time because I know she's very excited. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to share this slide. This was on the cover of the report from the Manitoba Centre for Health Policy. It's entitled Cherish, Cherish One Another and it's by an Indigenous artist um, Jackie Travers, and I think this speaks to the spirit in which we are building new relationships um, and expanding the role of the RT to provide services within First Nations communities. So our hope, my hope, personal hope, is that we're able to continue the building those relationships and offering them some type of respiratory services and just helping them understand that they can stay at home and not have to travel for these healthcare services. Thank you. Hello, I'm Maureen, and as Sandra said, I'm very excited to be giving this presentation now. She's absolutely right. I'm very excited to talk to you today a little bit about my experience with service learning. Um, 
In my introduction, it was mentioned that I'm passionate about exercise and exercise is medicine, so it's no coincidence that I've put the word strengthening into my title and no coincidence that I put a little uh, emoji or icon of somebody getting stronger in my title. So um, I hope you see a little bit about how our service learning project has helped to strengthen the communities. So the title of our service learning project is not a very exciting or creative title. I'm not a creative person. Um, so I've titled it Service Learning at Silo Mission because in fact we are service learning at Silo Mission. So I thought I would tell you a little bit about Silo Mission just to start. Um, and so for those of people in the audience who are not from Winnipeg, I'm going to just give you a little bit of an outline of where it's located. So if you look at the picture on the right, you'll see a big star. That's where Silo Mission is approximately located. Um, and if you notice what I've tried to capture in that map, which was challenging to get a map on here like that, is that I'm trying to capture a silo mission is very strategically placed in downtown Winnipeg. Um, here's downtown Winnipeg around here. Here's the forks here. I understand you'll be touring uh, the Human Rights Museum, so it's located right about here. Um, it's also very closely located to our Point Douglas uh, area of Winnipeg and the North End. Here's the Health Sciences Centre here, so you can see its proximity to the Health Sciences Centre. And to give you a scale in terms of the size, um, I can walk from the Health Sciences Centre to Silo Mission. I am a brisk walker, but I can walk in about 15 to 20 minutes. So it kind of gives you the scale as to where Silo Mission is located. And as I mentioned, it's strategically located to be in one of the areas of Winnipeg that has a very high concentration of Indigenous people, a very high concentration of people who are homeless, who are financially challenged. Um, and so it's strategically located because the mission of Silo Mission is to provide opportunities for change to the homeless and to the people that are less fortunate. Um, so that's why it's placed there. So the picture on the left is a picture of the building of Silo Mission. Um, that is uh, Silo Mission as it was when I first started helping there in 2015. It's now undergone a great expansion. So the lineup of people there are waiting to uh, get a hot meal for dinner or waiting to sign up for emergency shelter for a warm place to sleep at night. So those are two, those are two of the services that Silo Mission provides. Um, but it also provides other services such as counseling, uh, transition workers who help people find housing and help people find jobs, um, clothing, um, and another service is the gym uh, in, which is housed inside the health centre. So the Saul Sayre Health Centre is a program of Silo Mission. Um, it is a multidisciplinary health clinic. Uh, this is a picture of Angelica Fletcher, who is a registered nurse and who is the manager of Silo Mission. She manages the volunteer health care providers that come to Silo Mission each and every day of the week when it's open. That's a list of some of the health care, uh, allied health care professionals that volunteer their services at Silo Mission every week. Um, and you can see PT for physiotherapy is one of the services that's offered at Silo Mission. And the last one that's offered there is the gym facility, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. This picture here is, uh, is one of the examination rooms where the doctor would see clients. There's also a special room for physiotherapy and chiropractic care. There's a full-service dental clinic. Uh, with, when you open the door, you'd think you were in any other dental clinic in Winnipeg. There's a full-service optometry room where people can have eye tests done. Um, and the equipment that's there is state-of-the-art and has been generously donated either by local business people or purchased from donations. So I'm going to divide the service learning that we're doing at Silo Mission into two phases. Phase one started in 2015, and it actually did not start with me. It started with one of our students named Curtis Friesen. Um, he was involved in a, a, an assignment for one of his PT courses where he had to tour Silo Mission. And he went with his group to Silo Mission, and on the tour they were taken to the gym facility, which is on the fourth floor of the original building that I showed you. And when he went to the, on the tour, they told him that the gym facility could not be accessed by the patient, patrons any longer. That's what they referred to their clients. Because there was nobody there to supervise them. So they had a facility, but the patrons were not able to exercise simply because there was no supervision. So Curtis got it in his head that he was going to find a way that PT students could be there and supervise these patrons. Um, and so he approached me. I guess I seemed like a good fit because I am uh, the instructor that primarily teaches exercise and, and my students know as I'm very passionate about exercise so of course I couldn't say no. Um, so Curtis's plan was that every Thursday, which is when the health center is open in the evenings, we would go um, and we would provide supervision to patrons who wanted to exercise. 
And so in the fall of 2015, we, we opened our doors, so to speak. The gym was already there. It had been there since 2011. This is just a sample of some of the equipment that was available to us in the gym. The equipment, again, is there by donation from local businesses. Um, so it's not new, but it is fairly good equipment. You can see we have two treadmills. We used to have three. Um, I'm going to tell you now, though, that I have this odd, and it's like burning me or something like that. So I'm just going to move it. I'm going to hold on to it. I'm wondering, why do I feel like I'm burning? I'm not nervous, but I'm feeling like... Anyway, so I'm going to hold it. It's, it's just really hot. Okay. Sorry for those of you listening. You can't... This is what it looks like. I don't know where they are. Anyway. Uh, okay. So here are some treadmills. We have aerobic equipment. We have two treadmills. We have a rowing machine, and we have two bicycles, uh, stationary bicycles. And then we have a good uh, selection of resistance equipment. So we have a bench press, a squat rack, which you can see in this picture. We have a pulling machine and we have a nice selection of dumbbells, uh, weight bench, uh, resistance bands, etc. So in the fall of 2015, Curtis and I um, came to Silo Mission for the first time. We did some prep work in which we went and we went around and talked to the patrons and told them what was happening. We did some advertising. Curtis made a few presentations uh, and then we started to get our patients or our patrons, sorry. And so every week we had, starting up, maybe two or three people, but very quickly, uh, by the end of the first year, we had 15 people coming on a regular basis to work out in the gym. And what would happen is they would sign up. It's a first-come, first-serve basis. And then the students that were there, um, we would pre-screen to make sure they were safe to exercise. And if, if so, then we offered them the opportunity to have a personal trainer or a personal exercise program so that we could get the students practicing some of the things they had learned in my classes. Um, and then if they didn't want that, they could exercise on their own. Or we, we would often just walk around and we were available to answer any questions. And often that was enough to open the door. Um, so that then they would then want us to provide some kind of exercise. So that's how it went for about the first three years. Then we moved into phase two of our service learning program at Silo Mission. And what happened is that, a good thing, is that Silo Mission has undergone a very large expansion. Uh, so that original building that I showed you is no longer the, the main area of Silo Mission. They've added on a hundred million dollar project, a new two-story building on the side which will have a hundred new uh, shelter beds, a new drop-in center. What this meant is that we were not getting the kind of traffic that we had been getting for our gym program and there wasn't a lot for the students to do. So I now started thinking, what could we do to improve the experience of the students, but also to meet a need. And the need that I saw was that people were not, uh, that there were a lot of people that needed physiotherapy services, but the physiotherapy services, although offered there, were very infrequent. Um, and, and we had actually referred some of our gym patrons to physiotherapy, and the lack of consistency made it very frustrating for the patrons. So I came up with the solution this time, and I decided that I thought we could combine the gym program uh, and physiotherapy services up on the fourth floor, which is where the gym is, the health center's on the main floor. So what I did is this is the gym that I showed you before. This is the corner of the gym over here. Um, you can see that this isn't a new table, treatment table by any stretch. It's actually a rescue table, not to be confused with a rescue dog. Um, but I did rescue two tables from Deer Lodge Center because I knew that the physiotherapy outpatient departments had closed and that a lot of physiotherapy departments were getting rid of their equipment. So I approached them and they said, oh, we're about to throw them out. And I said, please don't throw them out. So I rescued two tables. I created a little corner in the gym where we could create a private treatment space and so we have some temporary screens there. In the lockers is some of our other equipment that we use. We don't have any EPA equipment. We use our hands and we use our voices so we provide a lot of education. We prescribe, as you might not be surprised, a lot of exercise. We can use the gym with our exercise programs. Um, we do use manual therapy so we will provide mobilizations um, and massage um, as well but the primary focus is on education and exercise. On the right, I just included this picture just to show you there's a desk area there where we can interview our, our patients, but also during the time that we're there, there's a computer or a laptop there, and we do electronic record keeping. So we're on the same system as the health center, and the students are able to chart and access the uh, health information for all of our clients. So just very quickly with my last couple of minutes, I just wanted to look a little bit at what is the impact that we had on this community that we went into. So first of all, the patient in impact. So these numbers are just from the last year. So we're there from September till June, once a week. Um, we're there for about two to three hours every time that we go. 
we see about two to three patients every week. So the number of patient visits over the past year is 154, and the number of patrons that have accessed the gym is 121. Maybe those numbers don't seem high, but they seemed high to me because they seemed like 154 people that had access to physiotherapy services that would not otherwise have had it. The average number of visits for our clients is one. We don't get a lot of people coming back, even when we say, see you next week. Um, we may not see them next week. We may see them four weeks later. We may see them six weeks later. We may not see them again. We don't know. So our treatments are tailored accordingly. And like I said, a lot of education, a lot of exercise, things that practical things that people can take away with. We have had a lot of people return, like I say, four, six, eight weeks later. I'm there every week. I know who these people are. They know who I am. You start to develop relationships. I start to hear lots of stories. That's a very meaningful thing about this program for me. 100% of our patients have come in with MSK complaints, um, but these patients have other complex health care needs. Almost 100% of them have another chronic health condition, with mental health conditions being the most uh, predominant, but also a lot of patients with diabetes and hypertension. They also have complex social needs. A lot of uh, patients or clients have uh, struggles with addiction. A lot of them have been victims of violence. Um, a lot of Indigenous uh, patients, although I have to say that most of our Indigenous clients have been to the gym and we have not had a lot of Indigenous clients accessing physiotherapy services, which was interesting to me. Um, and other social needs like, of course, poverty and housing. So immediate complex needs that they have. And I already mentioned um, what types of interventions we have been giving. So what's the impact of learning on our students? And this is how I'll finish. Um, we took this picture last week. These are four of my babies that come with me. Um, there's different students every week. Um, the gentleman on the left is Chris. He's my uh, coordinator for this year, so his responsibility is to make sure there's people there every week. We usually have two uh, MPT2 students, so that's the gentleman on the left is Chris, and the gentleman on the right is Scott. They are MTT2 students, so there's usually two of those there every week, and then they work together collaboratively with the MPT1 students, so they are learning together. So the two in the middle are our MPT1 students, and Kaylee, as always, is looking very happy there on the left. Um, something I just wanted to mention, I'm going to show you a few quotes from the students in a second, but something that's unique, I know that service learning can be part of the curriculum. This service learning that we're doing here is not part of our curriculum. This is completely volunteer for these students. They're there because they want to be there. I'm a very emotional person, so I could actually cry when I'm saying this because I feel very strongly. They are happy. They're happy to be there. They are there for no other reason than they want to serve the community and that they want to learn. And I find that very moving, and I have enjoyed so much uh, the cohorts of students that I have worked with for the last f almost uh, four years now. 15, 16, 17, almost going on five years now. So rather than me tell you what the impact of the program has been on the students, I thought I would ask them. So I asked them to give me some things that they felt were impactful, and they sent me some emails, and I'm just going to give you a few quotes that they sent me, and that's how I'll finish off. Um, the first two quotes that I'm going to give you tells you a little bit about how it has impacted their learning experience, and the last two quotes tell you a little bit about how it's impacted them personally. Silo Mission provides me with the opportunity to put my knowledge and skills to work within the community. Silo Mission is a very positive and supportive learning environment for students with mentorship from a real-life physio. That's me. I wasn't going to put that part in, but I figured you probably knew that it was me. Serving others in a capacity like this keeps me grounded. And finally, Silo Mission has given me a broader view and a greater appreciation for the struggles some individuals face on a daily basis. It's a very powerful experience. The gentleman on the left, Scott, is a father of two small children and a wife. He's from Steinbach. He goes to school from 8 in the morning till 4 in the afternoon, and he chooses once a month to stay and not spend time with his family to come, and he always looks that happy. Um, so this is a, a program that's very dear to my heart. I do not feel like it takes any time away from my personal time because I just enjoy it so much, and I feel like it's just helped the patrons and it's helped our students, and so I thank you very much. Oh, this, okay. Oh, it's here. Okay, thank you.
Thank you. Yes. There you go. <laughs> okay. Okay. So thank you so much that uh, we can also present uh, some of uh, our work in uh, working with uh, communities. Uh, I present the work from the whole faculty, so I'm the uh, head of the occupational therapy department, but the uh, work I present is from the whole faculty. So first something from our Amsterdam University of Applied Sciences. Uh, as uh, you heard before, Amsterdam is a big city, same amount of uh, people as you have in Winnipeg, but the situation is that uh, it is a very dense city and uh, it's not so big as uh, your city. So uh, this is uh, quite how it is in Amsterdam. It's uh, full of people, very busy in the center. And uh, here's another slide of our Amsterdam University of Applied Sciences. So that's uh, part of the Kennel District, uh, beautiful photo and our students who are working uh, within the city of Amsterdam. So, Amsterdam uh, from the air and uh, in our university, uh, we think it's very important that our students are working also in the city with communities. So communities are not everywhere in the north, but they are within our uh, city. And from the uh, mission of our uh, Amsterdam University of Applied Sciences, we say that uh, the city is our classroom. Our students and lecturers work closely with citizens and organizations to come up with solutions to challenge facing our city. So from our university, we think it's very important that our students are also working direct directly in the city of Amsterdam. So. We are from the Faculty of Health, and the Faculty of Health is one of the seven faculties of our Amsterdam University. And uh, in total, we have uh, 46,000 students, uh, and they are uh, within uh, four faculties. Uh, this is the central faculty in the center of Amsterdam, it's the big faculty. This is uh, our faculty. Oh, First, this is the Faculty of uh, Sports and Nutrition, and Wilma is also Dean of that faculty. Uh, this is our Faculty of Health, is in the southeast of Amsterdam. And these two neighborhoods where our faculties are placed in are uh, both neighborhoods with a lot of uh, people with a migration background, uh, with a lot of people who are living on the margins. So these are also the places where uh, a lot of our projects are located. So in the neighborhood of our own schools. A little bit about uh, the situation in the Netherlands. We were moving, or we are moving, we are in a transition from welfare state to a participation society. And that's because of uh, uh, developments in, uh, our, uh, in Europe and also in the Netherlands. So we have an aging society, and uh, Stefan also talked about that uh, yesterday, with a rise of uh, chronic diseases and also a lot of people with more than one chronic disease. We have a rising financial costs of the healthcare system. Uh, we, are in, uh, we are in a big transition of a decentralization of health and social services from the government to the local uh, municipalities, and we have an increase on migration. So because of that, uh, our uh, governments uh, stated that's important to uh, stop with our welfare state. We had a beautiful welfare state and to go more in that participation society. And in such a society, uh, citizens has to steer their own process, are responsible for themselves, and we know that not everyone can make that. And that's uh, also a big thing. And with, because of that, we have also an increase of health inequalities and we have a lot of vulnerable groups in our city. And when you're uh, talking about health inequalities, it's about uh, seven years 
a difference uh, for people with a high education or a low education. So people with a high education have seven years more to live than uh, people with a low education. So also in the Netherlands, a very uh, Western country, uh, there's also a big gap in health for people. So that's also why uh, we think it's important from our faculty that we uh, work also with people who don't can't steer their own process and uh, who have uh, who need support. So uh, we talked also about uh, Irma Vitality. That's our center of expertise. And within Irma Vitality, our projects, our research projects, our educational projects are placed. And uh, I will tell you more about some projects we are uh, doing uh, from our faculty. So uh, first, I will introduce you to a colleague of us. It's uh, Lea den Bruder. She is uh, also an uh, associate professor. And uh, her professorship is about health and environment. And she's an expert in uh, citizen uh, science. So her... Uh, uh, professorship is about how we can help people to lead a healthy life in their own uh, neighborhood and she is also she's working one day within our faculty and she's working the rest of the week uh, in uh, the Net Netherlands National Institute for Public Health and Environment and that's a big institute uh, it's uh, uh, for whole uh, the Netherlands and they do a lot of research on everything associating with health and environment. So that's very nice that she has that combination and uh, that uh, gives us also in our faculty uh, uh, a lot. So uh, three of her projects. The third project is uh, the project uh, Bias Quarter. And Bias, that's a uh, uh, sort of Dutch word for uh, uh, prison. And uh, it's the old prison in Amsterdam, and uh, it's uh, completely uh, restored, and the towers are going down. And there will be a new neighborhood for uh, citizens uh, from uh, different, uh, uh, different houses, so social houses, but also uh, houses for people who can earn, uh, who have more money. So what? We like what she liked in this citizen or in this uh, neighborhood is uh, to try to make it a healthy neighborhood uh, that promotes uh, physical exercise, social interaction, and uh, also a healthy diet. So, with students of different uh, uh, programs, she does research on future residents, on proxy groups. And uh, they uh, perform small-scale studies to uh, evaluate what people want and what's important to make this neighborhood as healthy as possible. Another uh, project uh, of her professorship is uh, Look, a Healthy Neighborhood. This is a citizen science project, so citizens, uh, they are uh, collecting the data by themselves. And they are collecting the data by using an app. They made an app and they made it uh, in collaboration with the citizens of that neighborhood. And uh, with the app, people walk through the neighborhood and uh, uh, with a cell phone and uh, evaluate uh, how it was, how uh, playgrounds are, how uh, streets are, how parks are, etc. to uh, evaluate what people think of their own neighborhood and which step to make to make their neighborhood a little bit better. So uh, residents are uh, busy and uh, to create um, better health in their own neighborhood. Another project of uh, Lea is uh, she's organizing or she's developing a uh, community health school and uh, that's in the western uh, part of Amsterdam and uh, the western neighborhood, the western part of Amsterdam and she 
likes to combine students with residents to learn with and from each other. And she's now busy on a local food project with uh, the residents and try to find healthy diet solutions with young residents. And she's very, fo very much focusing on participatory action research to do it together with the youngsters, with the people in that neighborhood. So that are three projects from Lea. Then I go on, and uh, this is a project about an age-friendly neighborhood. Amsterdam is, uh, uh, according to the World Health Organization, an age-friendly city. So it's also important to, uh, we know that policy, but also to make it uh, more visible and more touchable in our city. So my colleague, Fenna Van Ness, she did a uh, project with the uh, uh, municipality of Amsterdam uh, about uh, in one neighborhood to uh, evaluate with uh, elderly people in that neighborhood uh, what, uh, how is our neighborhood, is it age friendly or is it not so age friendly? So it's a research project uh, for and also by elderly. So the elderly people are the co-researchers in the project. And uh, the goal was to improve the elderly friendliness of this neighborhood. And this was a, project, a process of uh, co-creation. And uh, there were some elderly in the project and they uh, asked all the elderly to about their neighborhood. Thus the elderly were, were self the researchers. So that gave a lot of information. Uh, what they thought about their neighborhood, and uh, it was uh, about uh, uh, um, about the streets, about uh, uh, walking. Um, that the uh, that there were no were no barriers uh, or things to fall down, etc. So uh, make it more accessible the neighborhood. It was also about uh, uh, placing um, bankjes. Um, what do you say? Benches. benches. Oh yes, benches. <laughs> <laughs> so when elderly are going for a walk, they can sit down and uh, go further. So uh, it was a very nice project. And uh, there was a lot of information from the people themselves. And uh, after this, there was another project. And that was based on uh, the uh, the things that came out from uh, the project and this is about age-friendly routes so that elderly people can easily go in their neighborhood and this is a project from Caroline Rijkers and a colleague also from uh, occupational therapy and uh, this is also part of the age-friendly city project of Amsterdam and uh, they created uh, uh, age-friendly routes and that was because they placed uh, a lot of benches uh, within uh, uh, this neighborhood. And they did it in three different neighborhoods and uh, with students, with structured observation, interviews and group meetings. They evaluate what people, what elderly people uh, thought about the benches, about the other things they do, did in that neighborhood. And uh, this project is just finished. People were happy with their benches, but they had also some comments out they, that they like to be a little bit higher or on other places. Uh, they have uh, recommendations about uh, spaces where they can meet other elderly people and so on. So it's very nice that we had first the project with the elderly that uh, gave the recommendations how to change their neighborhood. And with this uh, project, we evalu evaluated the adaptations and uh, we can go on in, uh, in the next phase of this project. So this is a project from Rike Hengelaar. She's also uh, uh, working in our uh, School of Occupational Therapy and she is doing um, research on informal care and diversity. And uh, it's about understanding the role of diversity in the collaboration between the professional, between the informal caregiver, and between the clients. 
and uh, she does it with clients with non-congenital brain injury. And she's uh, doing uh, participatory action research, so she's also the, um, the informal caregivers and the clients are part <coughs> of uh, the research and are working also as co-researcher in their uh, projects. So she's focusing on, the, on intersectionality uh, to uh, grip, to have to, to get grip on the big uh, uh, concept of diversity. And uh, she's now uh, in her second year of her PhD, so uh, it's moving forward. She's working with a community of praxis and she's now busy on her first qualitative research on interviewing the people. Uh, about the role of diversity in the network of uh, the caregiver, professional and clients. Another project is on healthy and active aging. It's also from Fenne van Ness and it's a, a group program for all the persons living at home. It's uh, focusing on health promotion. It's based upon the lifestyle redesign studies, and I think you know them. And the latest development, development in, our, uh, in this project is that uh, it's not the OT or uh, PT or social worker who is leading the groups, but we are focusing on and collaborating with seniors who were the, uh, we become group facilitators together with the professional and later on they can do it themselves. So try to uh, make this sort of groups uh, more accessible and also uh, not dependable from a uh, professional, but that elderly people do it themselves. So with uh, participatory action research, we uh, evaluated uh, the program and also the duo group facilitator. We trained a lot of uh, elderly people in uh, how to uh, lead a group and how to do that. So uh, it's a very nice project and uh, it's a project that uh, is going on for several years and uh, every time we can put some extra in it and we evaluate it. So this is going on. And this is the uh, project from uh, Nadine and uh, I, I, I asked her, you can better <laughs> talk uh, about it by yourself, but uh, I, uh, for me it's nice to, to uh, uh, to let you see what Nadine is doing. She is uh, busy on an, uh, this course in practice in uh, Dutch re refugee integration programs. And uh, when you look to our programs and to our policy in, uh, in refugee integration in the Netherlands, it's very individualized and uh, it's placing the responsibility and blame solely on the refugees. So Nadine is busy now on a critical analysis uh, how this course on integration in government and citizen initiate initiated programs. So we have in the Netherlands programs which are uh, initiated by the government, but we have also bottom-up projects with, uh, with uh, citizens are uh, initiated programs uh, and that's an big difference uh, when you see it from the outside. And Nadine is evaluating how uh, critical, how the discourse in government-led programs and citizens-led programs is maybe different, but uh, we will see. And this knowledge is important and it contributes to understanding uh, how integration is promoted in the Netherlands. Uh, and how uh, our uh, how citizens in the Netherlands are thinking about refugees and how uh, programs are going, and this has a lot of impact on the refugees themselves and uh, how they experience the integration. So now, if 
two last programs and that are uh, educational programs. It's about interprofessional education uh, within our faculty of health. We have a program about uh, wake up call. It's, uh, it's when you, uh, in English, it's about a neighborhood call. And it's about the development of an uh, interprofessional academic learning workplace uh, with students and with a neighborhood clinic. That's not the hospital, the big hospital, but the neighborhood clinic is starting in uh, our neighborhoods, Amsterdam Southeast. And care and welfare students and their teachers uh, meet together and try to uh, build up uh, this interprofessional academic learning workplace. It started from uh, our uh, nursing, uh, school of nursing, and the other uh, professionals in our uh, building, PTs, uh, OTs, and exercise therapists of students, uh, they are also joining this project. So this, this is just started, so we don't have the results at the moment, but it's nice to build this up. And the last project you, I will uh, share with you is about <laughs> vitality in the neighborhood. It's the VIEW project. It's, al it's also about interprofessional education. I told something about it uh, uh, yesterday. And this is also a project with uh, the four um, programs in our faculty. So uh, we get funding for this uh, project to build up uh, uh, interprofessional learning in the community. So we s will start in the neighborhood of Amsterdam Southeast. And uh, we have uh, from every program one teacher who is joining and who will set up this, uh, this program. So we will start bottom up by uh, having uh, projects with citizens in the neighborhood of Amsterdam Southeast. So this is what I uh, like to present and uh, I think it should be nice that we have our work session uh, uh, in the afternoon to look if there are possibilities to have collaboration on different projects. So this, uh, uh, this, uh, these are our projects uh, from our faculty about working with communities. So uh, thank you for listening. I want to thank each of our presenters very much for sharing their uh, passions, their expertise, their colleagues' work. Uh, we won't have time for questions um, today, but our colleagues from Amsterdam are going to be here all week. We're having our working session now. If you want to meet with anybody individually, contact me and we'll see if we can make any arrangements. But please join us at any of the working sessions that uh, interest you and you're available for. Again, thank you very much to everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you.